the MIW Disruptive Podcast is sponsored by Mentorch. Mentorch is a social development network for mentorship. Go to mentorch.app to seek knowledge and leave a legacy. Welcome to the Disrupted Podcast by Minority Innovation Weekend. Minority Innovation Weekend is a weekend summit dedicated to aiding minority innovators on set focus startups, exploring emerging technologies, and showcasing tech startups that have a minority founder or co-founder. During each episode, we will discuss innovation, news about tech startups, as well as the startup ecosystem, and interview people of color throughout the startup ecosystem. Welcome to the MIW Disrupted Podcast, hosted by Sir Walter and Jerome. Today, we have a special guest. She is the Director of Customer Success at Yup, as well as the author of the Startup's Guide to Customer Success. We're talking about Jennifer Chang. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you for joining us. With uh, customer success, how do you how do you define customer success? I guess. Yeah, so I think that's a really great distinction. Um, customer, a lot of people think customer success and customer service aren't this, are the same thing, but in reality, they're actually two very different things. They work together, but there's two different things. So customer success is more of the more proactive side. So being able to reach out and talk to people, and understand like, and almost anticipate their problems giving them solutions before the problem even happens so that their experience is as seamless as possible. Whereas customer service is typically a more reactive, you know, I send in an email to the support and then they come back to me, but they're not the people who are reaching out to me being like, I think you are going to have this issue. Here's the answer. <laughs> and then figuring it out from there. Gotcha. So I, I was wondering, so I was looking at your website for Yup. And I just saw the many great things that uh, your company is doing, helping out students um, in math, learning math problems to help them solve math problems. But what is Yup's charter and goal? Yeah, so simply put, our mission is to empower every student to learn. We are a 24 seven on-demand tutoring company. So we try to help every single student get unstuck whenever they do get stuck on that math homework, whether it's 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. at night, you know, after soccer practice or right before uh, lunch break or anything like that. We're always there to help. And in terms of our charter, we, we were founded back in 2015 with the idea to democratize learning. Mm -hmm. And we've worked with thousands of students and hundreds of schools already. And I'm just really excited uh, to see us help more folks, especially in these uncertain times when student access to getting help just got a lot harder. Uh, and yeah, just so much harder on just so many different levels. Right. How do you manage to, uh, I guess, help everyone 24 seven? How does that work? <laughs> well, I got a superstar team uh, who, who does that, uh, who kind of manages all of our tutors, hires them, trains them. We do weekly trainings for our tutors. So we want to make sure they're the top of the top for all of our students. Uh, that team does an amazing job on predicting, measuring, and scheduling all these folks so that it's on demand 24-7, uh, within, usually within 15 or so seconds, you get a live person. Wow. One -on -one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is amazing right there. But So how did you define your target market? Yeah, I think this is something where everyone, regardless if you're at a Google or at a little startup just like me, uh, everyone's constantly iterating on this. And it's all about understanding your customer's pain point. So, you know, what are they looking for and what are the similarities between all these pain points as well as like understanding what you can deliver. And I think this is where some people always forget is does your product or your service actually address those pain points or is it some, or does it just some other pain point that this target market or these customers don't have. And then from there, you can find that market that is probably, you know, most likely suitable to your product. And then you continue to fine tune it. I, didn't, I don't think anyone's ever done. Um, and I think what's also really fun is that as you continue to develop new products, new features, like even in like a new, like little flow in the side, mm -hmm. your target market may shift and, or it may grow and you need to constantly stay on your toes. 
you think this concept could, could be applied to other subjects? I know math is math is usually <laughs> has like a, one answer or a range of answers and has a stuff you know process. Yeah, so this definitely can. We actually used to offer uh, chemistry and well as physics help, but we decided to just focus on math because not only is that what everyone was asking for anyways, um, we also found that you know math is not just procedural, it can be conceptual. So we actually created this framework for problem solving that isn't um, limited to math. It's, it's something where people, if people apply to their own lives, we call it UPSCR and happy to go through it. Like it can help you in any facet. It's, you know, under, U stands for understand. Understand what, you're, what the problem that you're trying to solve. Like understand you know, what's going on. Then plan. Have a plan on figuring out what to do next. S is solve. So you know, so solve it execute that plan. Then the fourth one is check. So C is check. Um, that's where you want to make sure that you're getting the right answer that you're, you know, if you executed a plan, say you like rolled out some new initiative, how, what metrics are you looking at? How are you making sure that you're actually hitting your goals? And then the fifth one, which is R is reflect. Mm -hmm. Think about, you know, what did you learn through this process? How can, how, what, how can you take those learnings to the next one? So you're not, you know, doing the same problem over and over again and relearning the same thing. Like, how are you moving forward? And this is actually how we teach in every single one of our uh, YUP sessions. And we try to instill this into our students to let them know that this is not just a math thing. This is about, you know, how do you grow yourself so that you can repeat this exact same framework later on in life. Awesome. Wow. So how, how, how actually do you recruit like your tutors and your instructors for these sessions? Yeah, so we, we, uh, we have a very uh, low application, uh, kind of acceptance rate for applications. You can imagine a lot of people want to, you know, become a tutor. They're a tutor back in high school or something like that, or just like really interested in math. But we make them go through two exams. And if they can go through these two exams, uh, more or less they're ready to go. The first one is a subject exam. It's like, do you understand what's going on? Like, do you actually understand the math? Some people think they know the math. I, you know, I'll be the first to admit that I actually failed the subject exam and I got a five on AP calculus um, back in the day. So yeah. it, this, this exam is hard. Wow. Um, like you can, you have to remember all, everything from geometry, probability, mm -hmm. statistics, trigonometry, calculus, wow. all in 30 minutes. Like it, it is not easy. Wow, 30 minute time test? It's a, it's it's a time, time test. test. Wow. We don't okay. want people to cheat and we don't want people right. to just like, you know, take their sweet time. <laughs> <laughs> students, yeah, students are going to wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we got that. And then we also got a teaching exam. And that teaching exam is key because we're an online platform. Like we don't send a tutor to your house. We're not like that. We want to make sure that, you know, you can get that service whenever you need. And teaching online is very different than mm -hmm. teaching in person. You know, you can't, see the body language as well. And we want to make sure that we're getting or, or recruiting the best tutors who can understand how to read between the lines and understand what's going on behind the text and not get so tripped up when they don't see the person's face. Gotcha. Well, wow, that's, that's really interesting. I, I didn't know it was that deep, but it, it's, really, <laughs> it's really pretty deep. Uh, going back to customer success, uh, I know your, your book was kind of focused on the startup. Do you think customer success is the same in a small, early company as it is as a larger, more mature company? Yeah, you're going to get different flavors of customer success, whether you're at a smaller company or whether you're at a bigger company. Uh, the reason why I want to focus my book on startups is because when you get to a bigger company, you're starting to look at like, how do I make sure that this little detail over here is great? And when I first started in customer success, I started reading all those blogs that were like, figure out your QBR, figure out this, figure out this. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. I don't even know how to do step one. Why are you telling me how to do step 10? This doesn't make any sense to me. So I wanted to create a resource um, to help those who are like me, who are you know, day zero, day one, trying to figure out what to do. So I do think um, there is a little bit difference. Like when you're first starting on in like a startup customer success where you're going to wear a lot more hats, you're going to do a lot more things. It's going to be a little bit more strategic, less procedural. Um, but then once you grow into those bigger accounts and um, bigger companies, it's going to get a little bit more procedural, but at the same time, you might be doing a lot more relationship building. Whereas for me, I'm doing a lot more strategy. Mm, okay. So with that, how do you map out the customer journey? 
<laughs> yeah, no, this is incredibly important um, because if you don't understand what your customers are going through when they interact with your product, it's going to be like driving in the dark with like the dimmest headlights on. You can barely see what's going on. And I think when it comes to like mapping this out, I would say first, like don't even touch a pen or a pencil. Re just reflect on a couple of questions to get those juices flowing. I would say three questions. One, what makes a customer successful in your service or product right now? And how do you know? Like, how do you actually know what's going on and how do you know that it's successful? I say two, when customers first join, what are customers most excited about? Like, what are, the, what are they always saying to you every single time you hop on that sales call? And then the next, once they're talking to you, what are they usually most confused about, right? And those are really good questions to just get the juices flowing. And then once you figure all of those out and got that time, you're just like, okay, I think I can, I'm ready to put some stuff to pen, uh, pen to paper. I would say block out some time, get a good whiteboard and start thinking about, I would say mainly four layers. And you can do this in a group as well. I think I've done workshops where we've done this in groups and they've been absolutely super fun. So would it recommend? Um, but I think the four layers would be first, determine the timeline. So, you know, what time frame are you looking at? Are you looking at something that is, you know, the customer journey is only going to be the next three months and that's all I'm going to focus on and care about? Or is it, I'm going to look for like the next two years? Like this maybe, you know, something as big and complex as like a sales force. Uh, you might need to look at a longer timeline than something where, you know, you open up like an Uber where you just like open the app and then that's it. You don't need to wait two years to get an Uber. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, think about that timeline. I think the second layer would be identify what the key my milestones are. You know, what are the key moments to your customer experience during that timeline? And then, so these, some people might call them like the quote, like moments of truth events, such as like the renewal date or like the first time they have, you know, their first ride with Uber or anything like that. And that's just like closely tied to business metrics. The third layer I would say is to add some customer touch points. So what, like, what exactly are you guys doing right now? And this doesn't have to be perfect. When you put something down, it's, put something down, what is, whatever is, you know, whatever is happening, don't feel the need to like constantly be like, oh, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this. Like, no, what is currently happening? And then figure that out. But anyways, what are the customer touch points? When is your cups, when is your company reaching out to the customer? Are you sending that receipt email after you charge a customer? Um, what are the t common times customers reach out to you? Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, uh, and this is, you know, something I enjoy doing, but I think some people leave this one off is adding some customer emotions hmm. and you know, what are your customers feeling at every single stage? So for example, does the invoice stress them out because they actually don't know how much they're going to be charged? Like that's really, um, that's really important. Like for example, for my company, I need to think of how students feel when they're using our app. They're, they're coming in because they're stuck. They're not coming in because they're super happy and they want to tell us all about their day, right? Like we need to understand that they're, used, they're coming to us for that reason and we need to meet them where they are emotionally as well. So I would say those are the four things when it comes to building out that customer journey map. Okay, nice. Wow. Okay, going back to customer success <laughs> and I guess comparison between the startup and uh, more mature company. Um, is customer success, is it, does it, is it defined the same way if the product is free versus uh, a revenue generating product? For sure, for sure. Because at the end of the day, we want to get customers to come back, right? Mm -hmm. what, because, I mean, if it's free, you're probably like showing ads or you're probably doing something else where you want people to come back and it's not just like a one and done deal. And that's where customer success comes in and, you know, more broadly customer experience. How are you making your customers feel at every single step of the way and how do you make sure that they are incentivized to come back gotcha. so is there a difference in approach that you would recommend if someone's providing a service versus providing a product in terms of customer uh, success so I would say, you know, there's been a lot of recent shifts in technology where I think the answer to that question used to be that it's it's completely different, but now I think it's more or less the same. So, you know, you can take, for example, buying a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And in the past, I know I would just go to the store, go to Target, buy a vacuum, call it a day. But now I feel like I need to 
compare prices beforehand and I need to think about, you know, how it's going to look on my wall. Like, do I, can I hang it up? Does it have a warranty? What color is it? Like how good is our customer service? I want to look at their reviews. Like it's a full experience now. And I'm sure that everyone has opened packages before where you see that little card that's like, thank you so much for, you know, right. choosing us. And if you have any questions, like leave a review or like reach out to us here. Like, I'm pretty sure that I never saw that card growing up. Right. <laughs> right. So you can really see it doesn't matter if you're a service or your hardware or your pro you have a physical product. It's mm -hmm. the same now. Okay. All right, we're, we're in 2020. Uh, what are some <laughs> tools that, that make a uh, customer, help a customer experience uh, be better? Yeah, so in terms of tools, especially for internal teams, uh, for, and I'm, you know, I'm saying for startups, I think when, when you get to a big company, you have some more specialized tools, but at the end of the day, startups, when you're a small team, you're running lean, you only need four things. The first one is CRM, so a customer relationship management a service. Um, this is just to make sure they could manage your accounts and know what's, what's where and how many accounts you have at any given time. I will say there are free options out there. So don't feel like you need to get that Salesforce right now. Um, I will admit, I'll be the first one to admit that my first CRM was a Google sheet and it lasted me a, a, like a strong four or five years. And it's like the best thing I've ever made. So don't feel like you need to go out, get that expensive thing. You can get something that's cheap, easy, free, and fits your needs. The second tool that I would recommend is email automation. So how do you, once you figure out what has been working really well for your customers, how are you able to automate that success? And email automation is one of those easy ways, you know, you don't wanna be sending receipts, you know, <laughs> manually every single time. So how can you figure out a way to not do that? Or how can you figure out a way where um, when a customer joins, you know, at 10 minutes, within 10 minutes, they're going to get an email from you and say, hey, welcome to the team. Welcome to the family. Super excited that you're here. And here's the next step for you to go instead of waiting maybe a day when you batch mail it or something like that. The third thing is data visualization. Kind of going back to you, understanding how, whether or not you're hitting your goals. Data visualization always helps us to understand trends, helps us to better. And as we said before, customer success is all about being proactive. It's like, how can you be proactive? You don't see, you know, you got to see a little bit into the future. How can we do that? Data. So that's a really great tool. Uh, and then the last but not least is some sort of self-service help center. So this is just a really great way for, ability, for customers to get quick help. Um, I think whenever, I, I know I get a little frustrated when I see uh, services where something breaks down and I have to just email in or I have to go ahead and like, way on the line for 30 minutes in order to get answer, like an answer to a very simple question, like how do I turn this on or something like that. Uh, sometimes you just need something where, you know, list all the frequently asked questions. I'm able to read them myself and not bother you and go about my day and then get that, you know, get the value that I want <laughs> out of the right. product. Gotcha. So are there like any metrics that can be used to like measure the customer experience? I know I saw, uh, I believe one of your blogs mentioned like MPS and CSET. So what are those uh, tools? Yeah, great questions. Um, MPS stands for net promoter score. It's typically, I'm sure you've seen those emails that say how, uh, out of, from a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend your friend to mm -hmm. this product? That's actually what they're trying to do is calculate their own net promoter score or NPS score. Yeah. Um, can go into what that calculation looks like, but the TLDR is the higher you're rated, the more the higher it goes. Okay. <laughs> and then CSAT stands for customer satisfaction. And that is usually um, kind of sometimes it's a thumbs up, thumbs down, sometimes it's a scale of one to five, one to ten, but it's like were you satisfied with the service that you had today? And that's typically more reserved for more customer service. Um, oriented organizations that are more reactive. Mm -hmm. um, so those are those two metrics. Those are definitely, you know, common metrics that you'll see, especially when it comes to even like investing or anything like people will always ask that. But, you know, when you bring up metrics, I think it's, it's a really interesting question, especially when it comes to startups. And I know you guys are all about innovation. So I'm sure if someone on this, uh, listening to this right now is thinking about, you know, 
well, I don't have a huge company. I'm only like five people. Like, what does this actually mean to me? Like, what metrics should I care about? Or I just started my startup yesterday. Like, what do you mean I should care about MPS when I have no customers? I can't even figure out my target market, right? So I think, um, you know, everyone keeps touting things like MPS or CSAT, but I recommend to choose metrics that match your customer success team's maturity. It matches even your product's maturity because that's where your team is really at. Um, for example, when I consult with startups, is this, if this is the first time you're selling to customers, uh, let's figure out, you know, what, whether or not people are adopting or people are adopting your service before even talking about churn, right? Because when you're talking about churns, like, well, that may be a year away. I need to iterate fast, right? right. I need to figure mm -hmm. out what's going on now. I don't have a year to wait, especially when you're started and funding, you know, could run out. Right. Um, so bringing that further up. And understanding like, hey, are people adopting? Hey, are people using the service? Hey, how often people are using the service? Look at those metrics first and focus on those metrics before focusing on such a long tail thing. Um, that's not to say don't optimize for it. Like, of course, you want to make sure that people enjoy your service that they will return, but right. not focusing on it so much that you forget, you know, the easy stuff at the beginning. Gotcha. Oh, going back to the self-service help center. I kind of like the search to help forum sometimes. Uh, people post solutions. Not always the company posting solutions, <laughs> but uh, you know, sometimes it's shorter. Uh, what can you tell us about customer segmentation and why is it why is it important? Yeah. So customer segmentation is when you look at your customers and you realize that there's maybe it's different types of personas within your customers. So for example, for my company, and you can you just imagine, you know, at school, not everyone's that kid who knows exactly what's going on. Maybe that there's kids who are really, really busy and they have like drama in five different clubs and they're not gonna have a lot of time. So that's maybe like one segment. But then there's another segment where, you know, they got soccer practice after and that's it. They got some time. They're they're able to spend a lot of time and figure out what's going on in their math homework. And those two are two very different types of students. So I need to make sure that I'm taking care of both and not giving them some middle of the road sort of like solution that does not satisfy either. And I think a really, my favorite story to tell when it comes to this is the car dealership metaphor where say you're, you know, you want to buy a car and you walk in um, or say, you know, say you're selling a car and you're figuring out like, okay, what type of onboarding or what type of experience, customer experience I want to give to these folks. Someone can walk in and be like, I want to read every single like manual that you have. I want to see the car. I want to inspect the car. I want to hear it. I want to read all these reviews before I even touch the steering wheel, right? Because I just want to know everything. And then you might have another person that comes in and says, give me the keys. I'm going to test, go for a test drive. Don't talk to me. I just, just give me the keys. And that's all they want. And say mm -hmm. you go, okay, well, I have the two different types of customers. I want to satisfy them both. So what if I give them a compromise and I give them both a brochure, right? And you can really know, you can really think the person who's like, I want to know everything, this brochure is going to be not enough for them. And they're going to be dissatisfied. And then the person who, you know, just wants to grab the keys and go, they're, the, they're going to be dissatisfied too because they're like, why do you give me this brochure? I didn't want this. Right? And this is why customer segmentation is so crucial is because you want to make sure you're tailoring the experiences that the customers, um, you know, what the customers need and what they actually, you know, uh, would like from your service instead of just saying like, here's my all one of all solution um, for you guys. So if you can't tell, I was all over your blogs. So you mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned this one quote from uh, Russell Belacher host of the CX Storytime podcast, you're not customer first if you don't understand that path to you. I'm gonna say it again, it's slower. You're not customer first if you don't understand their path to you. So you explain how important the customer experience is. How does someone develop a satisfy, satisfying customer experience that keeps the customer coming back? Yeah, only if there was like a one, two, three step process I can give <laughs> everyone here, that'd be so great. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the short answer is that you got to better understand your customer and build kind of a strong, what we call voice of the customer program through a VSC program where you can iterate on your customer experience and get it to that ideal state. Um, the longer answer is that it'll, it's going to differ for every single company and team. 
And even depending, so for example, depending on the number of resources you have. So sometimes you may have a ton of resources, you're able to figure out what that perfect customer, like for example, if I have a million people working under me, then I can say every single customer gets their own person and that person only works with that customer and boom, I'm done. You know, who needs the customer segmentation when everyone gets their own person like thing. But you know, business doesn't work like that. We do have restraints. Um, so we ought to make sure that we understand it. And then there's also the different types of customers that you have. So some customers, you know, same with the car dealership story, some customers don't need all of that. So their satisfying customer experience is pretty low effort work to you. But then there's going to be some other people who need a lot of hand holding or have a lot of questions or have a lot of complaints <laughs> right. or anything like that. And that's where you want to make sure that you're still able to satisfy those customers as well. Gotcha. Jeremy, there's something we didn't talk about. How did you actually get in started in uh, customer success or customer service in general? Yeah, that's, <laughs> it is, I think my career path has never been straight and I don't think it ever will be. Um, but I started out, uh, once I graduated college, I was actually going to go into consulting. I dabbled in banking, dabbled in government a little bit before coming into the startup world, but got poached um, <laughs> to come to a startup because I, and I, I love the team and I also love um, kind of the mission around empowering every single student to learn. And I think that was just so near and dear to my heart and education in general, so near and dear to my heart. So joined this team, it's a startup. We're still figuring out what we're trying to do. And we pivoted to this new strategy when we're working with parents. And we're working with parents to say, okay, like what's the best thing for your child? How do you make sure that, you know, Yelp is working well, well for your child? And what I realized is that once we got them in the door, I was like, who's taking care of them? And they were like, oh, yeah, the, the support team is. And I'm like, hmm. But then who's like thinking about what happens afterwards? And that's when I started pitching to the CEO um, to start the customer success vertical. And, you know, got was successful, but it was not an easy road because <laughs> you can imagine they're, they're starting to think about, you know, what does this actually look like? And I, you know, first time in customer success, I decided to just talk to a bunch of people. And not only did I find, find that one, people are so great out there and they're, they're always willing to give you advice, especially in the customer success world where everyone's very like, let's help out, let's help each other um, sort of vibe. Um, but two, I mean, that there was not a whole lot of resources in terms of like written resources for me to refer to, which is why I ended up writing my book um, for startups. And that's kind of how that story goes. And now it's three years later or so. Uh, and still, uh, still loving this industry and really enjoying how not only to beat the customer drum every day at work, but how it can really help students, uh, students thrive. Gotcha. So, so if you were to pitch to a company, why it's so important to have someone as the company, customer champion, what would you tell them? Simply, it's who else is going to think about the customer in the boardroom when you have that tough decision to make. Mm -hmm. And in the past, you know, 10 years, they have been, there has been a dramatic shift in customer expectations. You know, customers no longer buy things, they buy experiences. Mm -hmm. And you can think about that vacuum example from before, you know, it's not the same anymore. You really do need to think about the full experience end to end from, you know, when it's boxed all the way to when it's unboxed. It's not no longer just like a, you'll just assume that people will like it. And mm -hmm. because all of this is now a lot more standard, um, you know, there's a lot of different forms and different products, but a lot of CEOs, other CEOs out there are mm -hmm. taking an eye to this. And you can, and I have a couple of stats if you don't mind. Sure. I think, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so one is out of almost 75% of businesses out there actually named customer experience and success as their top priority. And that was from a Forrester report uh, a couple of years back. And you can, you can just see how many people are prioritizing this. Furthermore, 86% of buyers are actually, have actually stated that they would choose a better customer experience, even if it meant paying more. And then in 2020, so this year, customer experience actually surpassed price and product as a key brand differentiator. So you can think about, like, think about these three stats. It tells you that customer experience is not king. 
like that people care a lot more about this, even more than, you know, how much I'm paying. They maybe they may be down to pay an f- extra five bucks in order to get that really good experience because they know that they won't, won't have to worry as much. Right. And, you know, if I had to make that pitch, I'd give them these stats. I'd tell them to say, hey, if you don't have a customer champion within your company, you're going to be behind. And that's just the name of the game right now. And we got those big giants, Amazon, Google, all those folks who are leading the pack in this. And if people, you know, a lot of people use those services, people are going to get used to that. And people are going to get used to being cared for. So that means every single one of us, you know, they don't care if you, you know, you just started yesterday, you start, just started your company yesterday. We got to kind of live up to that experience. That's interesting. Thank you for giving us the examples. I guess uh, as far as customer success, uh, you mentioned that there earlier on there weren't that many resources out there and that kind of drove you to write your book. Um, I guess a lot of people turn to different examples of who's doing it right. In your eyes, uh, what, what companies or startups uh, are doing it right in your eyes? Great question. I think there's so many, for me, it's kind of similar to how I answer like, like who's your role model question? It's like, I like people, like there's certain qualities of people that I really enjoy and I want to emulate those qualities, but that's not to say that I love everything about them, right? So, (laughs) but I think I've taken a lot of advice and kind of like looking um, inspiration from this company called Superhuman and they're an email company and basically they kind of go on top of your Gmail and try to make email faster and easier for you to use. They've really champion customer success ever since day one, which I love. Um, they're, <laughs> they're the founders of Superhuman before they started Superhuman were actually um, had this other startup and they got bought out by LinkedIn. So you can really imagine like how, you know, these guys were smart. You guys knew what they were doing. So I love how customer centric they are. Um, I think in terms of a bigger company that maybe everyone knows, uh, Amazon is a big company. Again, this is where I'm like, you know, I love how customer centric they are. Doesn't mean that I love everything about them, even though I use Amazon quite a lot. (laughs) But, you know, Jeff Bezos is actually very famous, has has a very famous story where in every single meeting that he has, he's going to have an empty chair in in the room. And that empty chair that's at the table represents the customer because he wants to always remember the customer whenever he's having these big strategic decisions. And never forgetting that. And I think that is just an absolutely amazing way to kind of encapsulate this customer centricity within a company. So, and, it, and, it'll, and it'll trickle down, you know, whatever the leaders do, you know, the, the engineers will also be thinking about it, the designers, the marketers, you know, even if you're not in a customer success role, you're going to start thinking um, in a customer success way. And at the end of the day, that is much better for us as consumers <laughs> and also for the companies. Gotcha. You shared a lot of great advice uh, and information with us today. So what's something that you want to share to the listening audience that we didn't cover in this interview? Yeah, I mean, we definitely covered a lot. Um, I would say, I think one kind of like advice that I have to people, especially they're thinking about the customer success realm and looking at their own companies and thinking like, how can I be a lot more customer centric? I would say one, calm down. <laughs> just, just breathe. There's a lot going on uh, in this world in 2020, even at any company, even not in 2020, there's a lot going on. So just like, you know, take a breath. Everything will be all right. And kind of go with your heart. I think at the end of the day, it's, we're all trying to, we're all human. And when customers are interacting with each other, don't look at them as stats. Don't look at them as numbers, look at them as human. And I think when you bring that empathy into your work, into customer success, into your company, into that company mindset, you're going to succeed that much more because you're able to relate to that customer and you're able to really develop a product, you know, figure out that target market, figure out the customer journey map a lot more, not only easier, but also better because you're always thinking about, you're using empathy. And I think it's, it is hard for me to understand how, like how important that is. That's, that's awesome. The world could use a lot more empathy for sure. Oh, for Absolutely. Sure, for sure. <laughs> so where uh, can people get your book as well? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> um, yeah, so my book is available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. 
Um, and then I'm always down for people to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to chat and just talk more and talk customer success. I nerd about it all the time. So uh, it, I am always down to connect. Jennifer, we want to thank you again. I did attend your talk at the conference, at the oh, tech yay. summit, and, uh, <laughs> but I still learned a lot more through this conversation. Oh, that's great to hear. And thanks for coming to my talk. Well, I got there a little bit late, but <laughs> I heard like the last 10 minutes, but yes. <laughs> but yes, definitely thank you for uh, joining us today. Thanks for having me. That wraps up this episode of the Disrupted Podcast by Minority Innovation Weekend. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe. Check us out online at www minorityinnovationweekend.org and connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn.